Welcome to the United Nations University video channel. My name is Sebastian von Einsiedel. I'm the director of the Center for Policy Research at UNU in Tokyo. Uh, it is a particular pleasure for me today to welcome Monsieur Hervé Latsus, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and the head of the UN Department for Peacekeeping Operations to talk to us about uh, trends and challenges in UN peacekeeping. And uh, Monsieur Latsus, welcome. Thank you very much Tokyo. indeed. Um, let me start uh, asking a long-term question, which is after having gone through a boom and bust period in the 1990s, UN peacekeeping has witnessed a remarkable resurgence, uh, increasing troop levels from around 10,000 in 1999 to well over 100,000 today. What were the drivers of this resurgence? I think uh, there were several factors. First, the multiplication of crises, especially in Africa. The African continent now hosts uh, more than 80% of all our peacekeepers. And when you look at the arc of crisis that goes from the Atlantic and up to the Indian Ocean, across the whole of Africa, this is where the bulk of our missions are. And I think that's a fact. On top of that, I think there was a renewed confidence in the capacity of the United Nations to address those very complex crises, uh, which uh, must have uh, a very strong political component if one wants to address the root causes of uh, these situations. And of course, uh, massive uh, human suffering which brought the mandates of protection of civilians very much to the forefront. I think it's a combination of these factors. Now, if the United Nations was a country, it would be the second largest troop deployer overseas after the United States. Correct. With over 100,000 troops deployed, what are some of the challenges that the UN faces in terms of managing and supervising those operations? Well, first, the sheer figures, and of course, the uh, budgetary uh, element of, his, of it, because right now we are very close to and at a half, eight and a half million, billion dollars, uh, which is both a lot, admittedly, and not so much when you think that this represents only 0.4% of uh, consolidated world military expenditure, but still, the outlay is large and of course we are constantly asked to do more with less. Now there is a widespread perception that the environment in which peacekeepers are being deployed has changed in recent years and is becoming more more difficult. Um, peacekeeping operations are increasingly deployed to places where there is no peace to keep. Um, conflicts seem more messy, rebel mm -hmm. groups seem more fragmented, states which we are mandated to reconstruct are exceedingly weak, um, and we have increasingly the challenge of being targeted by jihadist groups and jihadist insurgencies. Um, maybe you can tell us whether you think indeed so much has changed or are we because in the 1990s, too, we faced very messy situations in Bosnia, mm -hmm. Rwanda, and Somalia. So what is actually the main things that have changed? I think it's only a combination of uh, many of the factors you have mentioned. But I think the most challenging one and the most difficult to handle has to be, indeed, that we operate increasingly in countries where there is no peace in the first place, and where instead of dealing with states, uh, we deal with uh, armed groups, armed groups which can be gangsters essentially, which is a case in the Central African Republic, which can be uh, jihadists uh, like in northern Mali, which can be also again in Mali transnational criminals that drug warlords and quite often in combination working hand in hand to achieve uh, their unholy goals. So it is, of course, a major concern because we value, of course, uh, very much the safety and security of our people. 
but in the face of situations where for a number of reasons we have become the targets. So we have to make it so that the concepts of operations are adapted to the requirements of the situation. We must invest a lot in uh, safety and security equipment, training, like for instance in northern Mali against mines, against IEDs which are increasingly sophisticated and which are used almost on a daily basis by these uh, bad guys. That is certainly a major difficulty. Another problem uh, is of course when we are asked to act with particular robustness. It is the case for instance in the Democratic Republic of the Congo where the Security Council, I think for the first time, asked us deliberately to neutralize the armed groups. And I do use the exact words of the resolution. Uh, that means, obviously, that we have to go for it and we have to be equipped for it and our troop contributors must be ready to go for that. So it's an added element, uh, one certainly that will be one of the very, very central topics for the review panel that has started work to work on peace operations uh, just a couple of months ago. I will come back to the review panel, but let me pick up on the um, reference you made to the use of force mandate that the UN has in the DRC. Um, this has triggered a, a new iteration of a debate that goes back to the 1960s, also in the context of the Congo, which is whether and when UN peacekeepers should use force. Now the lesson many took away from uh, operations in Bosnia and Somalia in the early 90s was that the UN is particularly ill-prepared to use force. Um, at the same time, lessons that many took away from Rwanda and Sierra Leone was that sometimes the UN needs to use force to uh, neutralize spoilers and protect civilians. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at the experience of the Force Intervention Brigade in the DRC, is that the new model for other cases? I don't think it is intended in the first place as a model. The Security Council made it very clear when it voted that particular resolution uh, that it was not creating a precedent, that it was a one uh, shot exercise, so to speak. Uh, and certainly, even though since we've had uh, other robust mandates, like in Mali, like in the Central African Republic, none of them feature a uh, force intervention brigade. I think in the case of the DRC, the concept has proved to be working. Uh, because uh, we have made some progress, not enough yet, but I think uh, it has been effective. One of the difficulties we face is to make it so that the, uh, so to speak, regular contributors, we call them the mainframe contributors, are reasonably comfortable uh, with that and to make sure that they work in a complementary way. But we had, at my suggestion, in November, a brainstorming session of the Security Council to look at the situation in Mali. And the conclusion, as I had uh, thought, was that the mandate was robust enough. Uh, but of course, it is true to say that in the case of Mali, we do have what we call a parallel force, which was the anti-terrorist operation uh, put together by the French, first Serval, just in Mali in the first year, and now Barkhane, which has extended to the whole of the region between Mauritania and Chad. Uh, so, in fact, it proves to say that there are only specific cases. You cannot have uh, one recipe uh, to fit uh, every situation. Uh, again, in Central African Republic, we have a parallel French operation, that is Sangaris plus also the European Union force, uh, U4CAR, which is uh, still working until March and which has been very instrumental in helping us all secure Bangui, the capital. So, well, we have plenty of uh, models. 
and uh, really it's a matter of uh, adapting to the specifics of a given situation. Now, as you've just mentioned, the Secretary General has established um, in the fall of 2014 a high-level independent panel on UN peace operations. The panel is expected to report to the mem membership in the summer of 2015. In your view, what are the most important reforms and improvements needed for UN peacekeeping? I think, uh, first, uh, the last work of that magnitude uh, on peace operations was the Brahimi report and that was in fact 15 years ago. So I think so much has been happening in the meanwhile both on substance in terms of scale, you mentioned it earlier, that it is good that we have people reflecting on all these evolutions and try and see whether the doctrine, doctrine still uh, applies or whether it has to be adapted. Uh, one good question, for instance, is uh, one of the three basic principles of peacekeeping. It's about uh, impartiality and neutrality. Now, look at the situation in the Congo. Can you be impartial vis-a-vis -vis armed groups who are killing, raping, putting hundreds of thousands of people on the road as displaced or refugees? who are recruiting soldiers in the tens of th uh, children as soldiers by the tens of thousands? Evidently, no. You have to bring in new tools. You have to bring in new approach. And we have just talked about the brigade. You have to bring in technology and, in fact, a new attitude. So I think these are some of the evolutions that need to be factored in, you know. With a view to what? With a view to... Uh, basically uh, try and reach a point of comfort for all those uh, who are concerned, and in particular those countries who contribute uh, troops or police, but also those who contribute uh, the money. And I would like to see the difference between the two groups fading away, because it is just not right to say that some countries pay the bill and that others pay the price of blood. This is not how it should be, and we're trying to correct this imbalance by, and it's happening actually little by little, bringing in more countries from the rich north as true contributors, bringing in the enablers, the capacities, the training that uh, is so necessary for the effectivity of our operations. Indeed. You, you have mentioned an earlier review panel that the uh, uh, UN had established in 2000, the so-called Brahimi panel, which reviewed UN peace operations then. One of the key recommendations of that panel at the time was that the Secretariat needs to tell the Security Council before mandating uh, operations uh, what it wants to, not what it wants to hear, but what it needs to know. Another recommendation was that the Secretariat needs to learn to say no when faced with over-ambitious yet ill-resourced mandates. Has the UN become better at that? Well, yes and no. I, I recall um, almost three years ago, in 2012, when the crisis in Syria had already been going for a year, when we were asked to deploy 300 unarmed military observers in Syria. I, for one, but many of my colleagues had strong misgivings. And indeed, as it turned out, it simply was illus an illusion to think that just deploying 300 observers would generate uh, pockets of uh, stability, of at least cessation of hostilities. Maybe the first week, but beyond that it became evident that it was not going to happen. So we pulled out and I must say it was a miracle that we didn't suffer a large number of casualties. But uh, I think, uh, you know, of course the Security Council is the body that gives us our marching orders. But it is, I think, uh, more, more than ever a necessity that we do have a dialogue and a dialogue in truth, in candor, 
so that we make together the, the right choices. Let me ask uh, you a question more on your personal experience with the UN. You, of course, have experience with the UN going back many years. You are in some ways a returnee to the UN, having served as deputy permanent representative of France uh, to the UN in the early 90s. Um, but when one suddenly starts working in the UN, things look slightly different from the inside than they did from the outside. Um, can you tell us what surprised you most after you took on your current job? Well, first, um, not having followed so closely the UN uh, in the intervening years, uh, of course, discovering the way the UN had adapt adapted to these uh, new situations. I think it says a lot about uh, the resilience of the organization, its capacity to adjust, and essentially, I would say, uh, rather well. Uh, of course, bureaucracy remains bureaucracy. Procedures are heavy, but that's also uh, because of the member states who have imposed upon us a number of regulations. But I think uh, there is certainly this uh, permanent uh, devotion to those ideals, which are those of the Charter, we the people, you know, the values, the human rights, the commitment to, to work and try at least to improve things a little, and if possible, a little more than a little, uh, but it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but I think that capacity to evolve is quite a speaking uh, uh, achievement. Indeed. One concluding question, if I may. Um, what is your one-minute elevator pitch on why member states should support UN peacekeeping? I would say, uh, in a nutshell, it's, uh, it's cheap for the price. Uh, many countries, uh, Western countries, have uh, studied very carefully uh, and compared what it would have cost them to handle a specific operation and the advantage was definitely in favor of the United Nations. And I think we are being uh, prudent managers in those difficult financial times. I think no other army in the contemporary period has been able to do what we have done. That is that in five, the last five years, we have reduced the cost per soldier of the United Nations by 16%. Uh, which shows that uh, with a will and with creativity, uh, you can uh, make a difference. Now, my concern is to continue to work on the performance. That's going to be my priority this year. And I think uh, we will look at it again towards the end of the year. But I hope very much that we will show that we can continue to do a better job um, Possibly not with less, but certainly with no more than uh, we are getting from the membership uh, at the present stage. Great. Well, we certainly wish you much success in this endeavor and would like to thank you for sharing your thoughts and insights with us. Thank you, Monsieur. Thank Dr. you very much, uh, Fernand Zito.